teaching to mankind is that which expresses itself in a response to the virginity of Christ viewed through the eyes of the world this kind of witness might seem to be a travesty might seem to be a kind of contradiction to human life and therefore very unattractive a kind of waste of a gift which might have been communicated with others namely the gift of natural life which however is deliberately renounced in favor of a fruitfulness of which the world has no knowledge on the contrary for which it has only ridicule because it does not understand it and yet we dare to call this particular effect or result of divine revelation manifested most perfectly in the life of Christ we dare to call this a choice fruit of God's manifestation of himself to mankind no wonder our Lord said that not everybody can receive this let him who can receive it who can accept it let him accept it knowing that the majority of mankind would not accept it so we are to render to God in union with Christ the life which he has given to us we are to give that back to him he has given us his son in and through him we are to respond with full obedience to our own vocation and mission detaching ourselves so as to become totally poor and offering ourselves to Christ or in Christ rather to the Father this realizes the fruit the gift the hundredfold for one before God who provides every gift we are opened to correspond to the giver by giving ourselves knowing that even this capacity to give ourselves is in itself a gift from God voluntary continence does not have the kind of place in the Old Testament which it has in the new but it does have its roots its origin in the Old Testament it is true that the religious sense of belonging to God which was had by the Old Testament people um, this religious sense seemed in their mind at least to require that they be prolific that they augment or increase the people of God by offspring and uh, offspring and in fact numerous offspring was considered a kind of contribution that they made to God Lord we're increasing your family now you've got some more worshipers as compared with those gods up in the other countries and so they wanted to become very very prolific and of course in their limited understanding of God's design uh, what they thought had value provided of course that they themselves and their offspring were really faithful to Yahweh and to the alliance entered into with him if they did that uh, then of course having more children and thereby increasing the messianic people would indeed be a blessing because it was reserved to a later time the New Testament times for people to voluntarily give up the right to physical offspring through lawful marriage in favor of a higher love and a higher fruitfulness so for the people of God everything was oriented towards growth and expansion virginity in the mind of an Old Testament person was equivalent to sterility and even if chastity or virginity was esteemed before matrimony meaning that a man who married wanted to be pretty sure he was marrying a virgin the true preparation for Christian chastity is found in the Old Testament in the perspective of the promises and the alliances 
And we'll explain in a moment how this is so. Oftentimes, God makes one see that the bearers of the promises <coughs> originate from an intervention of his will of love more than from physical fruitfulness. His gratuitous election is seen in the preference given to sterile women. Let's take some examples. Sarah, who is, of course, the mother of the believers through Abraham, the father of believers, was a sterile woman. Now, God was about to cause his revelation to expand. He was about to channel it through a particular family so as to keep it strong and pure in, and to give greater guarantee to the transmission of that revelation of his in a purer way than had been done before. And uh, he begins the execution of this plan by the choice of two people, the most unlikely to be able to do what he had in store for them, namely to become the parents of a numerous offspring, to become the originators of an entirely new people, a new nation, a nation and people of believers in God who would, by their faith and belief in God, meaning by their supernatural life, be the bearers of salvation towards other nations who eventually, in, when the Christ would come, would also be, be believers, worshippers of God. They would also accept the gifts of salvation. So why did he choose a sterile woman and a man who was on his very fastly on his way to sterility? Purposely chose him of that advanced age so that the world might know that this was really a divine intervention. St. Paul celebrates this departure of God from the order of nature in his letter to the Galatians, where he finds these personages, namely Sarah and Agar, who was the slave girl in the family, to be types of mere natural life and of supernatural life, and their offspring to be the bearers of salvation in the case of Isaac, who was given by promise and by divine intervention, whereas the other, namely Ismael, the natural son of the slave girl, was simply the type of the natural man. The re reading and study of that epistle in this particular connection is a very interesting and beneficial. So then he did choose a sterile woman, namely Sarah, and by his divine power caused her to be with child so as to show that uh, there is a certain uh, predilection for virginity. Now, you may immediately object and say, well, actually, Sarah did conceive and bear by her own husband, which is true. But the fact that he chose her only after she was sterile begins to be a foreshadowing, and that's the only point I'm making here, a foreshadowing of the greater predilection that God would eventually show for not merely the kind of virginity which uh, comes through the accident of natural sterility, but through voluntary virginity, freely and lovingly accepted by the followers of his divine son. There was the other example, of course, of the mother of Samuel, named Anna. As you know, her husband had another wife, of course, named Fenena, and Fenena was fruitful from the start. And every time she had a child, she liked to, pardon the expression, rub it in to make Anna feel all the more sterile <laughs> and all the more objectionable to her husband. So happened, of course, that, that her husband did love Anna and was only, he was hoping against hope that he might have children by her. And precisely because he loved her, the other wife and Anna figured, well, I'll get even, since you seem to be the one whom he loves more, and I'll be the producer. And he's got to love me more, and I'll put you in your place as the 
typical examples of feminine jealousy, of course, can succeed in doing <laughs> in cases like this. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you can read more about it in the first book of Samuel if you're interested. <coughs> but the point is that he did choose Anna, and uh, he heard her prayer. Her prayer for a son, which she promised to dedicate to God completely and fully, to place at his disposal, at his service, if he would deign to regard her lowliness, her humiliation, as it was considered in that time, and please give her a son. And of course, when the, the high priest, Eli, saw her and heard her, he thought that she was simply an emotional woman. She was all upset and that she had lost control. And he began to let her know that this is pretty much what he thought was going on. And she told him not to make fun of her in her depression and her sorrow, that she was very sincere and uh, that she longed for a son. And God willing, she would receive one, and of course she did. She received a son, and her shame, her disgrace was taken away, and she fulfilled her part of the promise. She dedicated her son Samuel to the Lord, and he was accepted by the Lord and was made one of the bearers of the messianic promises, one of those entrusted with God's word and the mission of salvation became the most outstanding of all the judges of the Old Testament and the one who introduced and consecrated, introduced the monarchy and consecrated the first king or anointed him. This was Samuel. You recall that in the temple as he was sleeping he heard a voice calling him and he immediately responded, here I am Lord. And then he couldn't find anybody around to tell him the rest of the message. <laughs> And so he went to the high priest and woke him up, who of course was not too pleased with the disturbance and his sleep in his old age, and told him he was dreaming and to go back to bed and sleep more quietly. But after three times, the high priest realized there's something going on here, and uh, found out, of course, that it was the Lord who was calling the young boy, the young man, and that uh, God had some special design. And then the high priest got awfully curious, wanted to find out when the Lord did communicate more to him what he said. And if Samuel was hesitant to tell the high priest what he said, it was because it meant the punishment of the high priest and the extinction of his family because of the sons he had who were forever stealing the sacrifices brought to the temple and uh, using them for their own support, taking the choice parts of the meat offerings and giving what was left, if they gave anything that was left, to the worship of Yahweh. So this young man had to tell Samuel the truth, or tell Eli the truth, namely that he'd better get himself ready because his days were numbered. But Samuel was the bearer of the messianic promises, and he was the son by promise, by divine intervention, of an otherwise sterile woman named Anna, his mother, who became a type of the Virgin Mary, and whose canticle in the book of Samuel very much resembles the Magnificat after she received her son. Again, we think of, the, of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Read the first chapter of St. Luke, and you see how Zachary and Elizabeth were far beyond the time of expectation. And uh, though they prayed uh, to God, and nevertheless, it seems that, well, we are not sure. The text doesn't make it that sure, and we can't be reading into the text. But as a priest, Zachary, of course, would have had to offer the kind of prayers uh, which were intended for all the people, rather than just to be thinking of himself. But God heard the prayers of Zachary for all the people, namely the prayer that the Messiah might come, and at the same time rewarded his faith, his fidelity, and his longing to have offspring of his own by granting him a favor which turned out to be the fulfillment of two things of his own personal and private desire or longing, namely for a son, for offspring, and also for the coming of the Messiah, because this offspring of his, called the Baptist, was to be the direct forerunner of the Messiah. And in fact, the Messiah would come in this, the high priest's own lifetime, and certainly the lifetime of his son, the precursor. Again, this was all part of the 
development, the unfolding of the divine plan, and another instance of divine intervention of a certain predilection, not for natural fertility, but for sterility, the presage, the forerunner, the overshadowing forecast of uh, true virginity and voluntary virginity lived and accepted for love of God. And there is, of course, the example of Jeremiah who did, who was single and led a celibate life. And the, the symbolic uh, solitude of the judges had the religious value of fruitfulness for the people, namely a certain solitude which they voluntarily accepted, not that they were not married, but after their marriage, they were dedicated to this task to be performed. And of course, it seems as though they were led pretty much of a solitary life. I don't think their wives saw so much of them. Again, merely a foreshadowing of what was still, what was to come later. Certainly the case of the, and we're talking here of Deborah and the prophetess Anna. Anna, of course, had been married, her husband died, and she was quite young, and she might very well have done all right by marrying again. But she chose to spend her time in the temple, spend her time doing good, and not to marry again. And she lived to see and to hold in her own arms the Messiah, the Christ, when he came to the temple to be presented. Certainly the case of John the Baptist, who was not married, who was the forerunner of Christ, the immediate, uh, the one who pointed him out more immediately and directly, called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, this tradition, which ends in the precursor, has had in all the prophets an intervention regarding the nuptials between God and his people. You recall that I mentioned the other evening, as in an answer to a question that was raised, that uh, the expression virgin daughter Sion was uh, a name which it pleased God to give to his people, uh, looked upon, regarded in this way, that he considered himself uh, to have chosen this people, whom he regarded as a bride, as a spouse. And he wanted no, he would brook no opposition here. He wanted them to adore no other God but himself, in other words, to be joined to him alone. And of course, there's no question of physical fertility here be, between husband and wife because God is a pure spirit. So that uh, he wanted them to be virginal in the sense of being spiritually united with him and only with him, through whom alone they could become spiritually fruitful and be the worthy transmitters of divine revelation of God's word. Here too you see how even in the Old Testament uh, the notion of virginity still unfulfilled in the way in which, of course, it was later destined to be fulfilled, but nevertheless casting its shadow in advance, uh, advancing towards the day when voluntary virginity would receive its proper place and would be glorified by precursor of the, of the Messiah and especially by the God-man and his mother. So the voluntary chastity in the New Testament is our next consideration. With the coming of Christ, virgin Israel, of which Jeremiah speaks, becomes the church. The church is the bride of Christ, and she is a virginal church. A, a virginal church who finds her ideal in the virgin mother of Christ, namely the Blessed Virgin, who willingly, voluntarily, wholeheartedly accepted a life of virginity and because of this complete gift of herself to God was so pleasing to him as to have been chosen by him to be the mother of a virginal son. So that without carnal intervention, without Joseph, her espoused husband, having any parts of this fruitfulness of Mary, she becomes with child of the Holy Spirit, not of Joseph, but of the Holy Spirit, and thereby claims or lays claim to the twofold glory of virginity as well as maternity. But her maternity is a spiritual one, 
not in the sense that she did not have a child, namely Christ, who had a body of flesh and blood, but uh, this human nature of his joined to the divinity was given to the world for its spiritual life. And since she mothered the author of that spiritual life, namely Christ, we can speak of her son as being the speak of her as being a virgin even in her maternity and her son certainly a virginal son who was destined to be wedded not to any human being a, a natural daughter of Eve but rather to the whole church to whom he communicates his life and love all Christians who wish to remain virgins share in Mary's virginity this, in the reality of today, is essentially eschatological and will have its fullness in the definitive completion of the nuptials with the Messianic Christ. And what are we speaking about here? Since we know from Christ's own words that in the kingdom that is to come, there will be no marrying or giving in marriage, but that all will be like the angels of God. In other words, that longing or desire for human nature to be joined in holy love to be completed to be fulfilled to be fruitful that that desire in its highest real ideal and realization can only take place in the life to come and yet in the life to come where it will take place it turns out to be a condition or state not of continual and blissful physical reproduction uh, through physical uh, carnal uh, intercourse or union of man and woman but uh, those who were partners here on earth will if they have if they both succeed in being eternally saved will find the kind of joy in each other which is not in themselves or for themselves so much as it is in Christ and through Christ who becomes the immediate spouse or partner of the soul of the redeemed and saved person They will, of course, find joy in each other to the degree that in and through their, the possible, the probable, I should say the proper uh, use of their married life, that they made the grade, that is, that they attained eternal life, and that they both now enjoy union with Christ. But in order to serve as a living witness or testimony to the fruitfulness, spiritual fruitfulness of Christ, in his earthly life and also to be a pledge of the spiritual fruitfulness virginal fruitfulness in the life to come it pleased Christ first of all to come in that condition himself in the condition of virginity and then to choose others through all ages of the church's existence and unto all ages to choose others to whom he would communicate this same gift divine gift which he possessed in its fullness. He would impart it to them through consecrated virginity, freely accepted, so that their dwelling among the children of men would be this continual <coughs> external sign, which extolled and continues to extol the virginity of Christ, which virginity they, the chosen people, consecrated people, perpetuate, at the same time would let the whole world know that in the life to come this is the kind of union that is going to exist a union that will be blissful that will be fruitful that will uh, be rooted and in love and also will find its fruition in love but not in the earthly sense therefore in the sense in which Christ explains in the sense which you yourselves already witnessed to by your lives of virginity. With this difference, however, that uh, the difficulties, the hardships, and the, the, mere, the gradual developing union with Christ already granted to you here will, of course, reach its, reach its perfection and fullness in the life to come. Now, this requires faith. It's the daily test of your faith and of your love and let it not be the kind of love that, 
that is charged with selfishness and that for mere, for less than supernatural reasons would finally reach the conclusion of just gritting your teeth and bearing it, that would be quite unworthy of a person who has been called to the free and loving union with Christ through freely accepted virginity. Let it be a joyful thing. Let it be one that is knowledgeable, knows what it has done, what he or she has done and why they have done it. And to be joyful and happy about it, though it does and always will imply sacrifice. Perhaps married life never seemed more attractive, never seems more attractive, at least in its ideal state, than it does after a person has taken the vow of chastity. That's interesting enough. Young students and seminarians, when studying about marriage, because of having to be knowledgeable when they lead others or teach others, begin to think, well, my, oh, my, that's really magnificent. That's absolutely wonderful, blissful. Whatever made me in my less sane moments <laughs> or in my youthful ignorance rush in where angels appear to <laughs> and take up a life like this when their sudden awareness and their developing maturity makes them realize what they're missing. And yet, of course, if they persevere in their vocation and become to know through the grace that is given to them what the differences are and that what they have done was done freely and now, of course, is, confronts them again to be confirmed as another free act each time that they may be tempted to look on the other side of the fence where this other kind of life is lived, they need to renew and to confirm that act, free act of acceptance year by year, if not day by day, or as often as they become particularly conscious or aware of it. And all of this, of course, tends to prove the power of God's gift in them and the fruitfulness if after a greater experience of life and uh, the attempt and effort at helping people who are in the married life, uh, they come to realize what they have given up at the same time why they have given up and are willing freely to renew this voluntary gift of themselves out of love for God. Then it becomes truly fruitful in them and it beautifies them, makes them fruitful for very, very much good among those whom they serve. And the restraint which it requires, the sacrifice that it demands, tends but to intensify their love and make it more mellow and mature and more supernatural. And again, I repeat, more fruitful for supernatural good. At the same time, that the, the, the relish and the, the uh, enjoyment even, spiritual of course, enjoyment of the close personal union with Christ begins to be perceived by them so that their lo loneliness is dispelled and they realize that this is for real, this is for good. Uh, this is a tr real life, this is fulfillment. Since we hear so much about fulfillment in our days, <laughs> as though there's only one way in which it could be accomplished and Christ must have failed quite miserably because he came and went unfulfilled, uh, according, judged according to the standards of what we've been hearing about. That brings us, of course, to the chastity of the missionaries themselves. Well, really, in speaking about or just referring to seminarians, we're actually including you because it's not just seminarians. We're not just male religious of, of whom this is required. It is the gift that is given to you. Rather than think of it as something that's required of us, sacrifice made by us, which of course it is also that. And let's look upon the more dominant factor involved in this kind of condition or state of life, namely the privilege uh, which it uh, involves, the privilege which it expresses that among the millions of men... Oh, love. And it was not dependent upon this or that requirement 
through education or perhaps physical attraction or whatever else may be your natural or super, your natural endowments, but rather his own free choice, his gift, in which he singled you out, in which he expected a, a very abundant return of love and of fruitfulness to be given to you as a result of this exchange of love through voluntary chastity. That this voluntary chastity will continue in the world, you can be certain. Christ will perpetuate it in the church. Whether it is to be perpetuated by some who, having received this gift, have now abandoned it, that, of course, is what they, in their human mind and will, have decided to do. And that is up to them. But that, if it's rejected by some, it will be picked up by others, again, I say, you can be sure. Well, it has been offered to you, and you have accepted it. And let it be an acceptance for life. Let it never be a mere temporary one, as if to say, well, Lord, I tried it out, but uh, this fulfillment bit that's being talked about seems so much more attractive, and so let's settle it, Lord. Let's get a divorce. Let's simply settle it by saying that it was good while it lasted, and uh, even if I can never pay the debt that you gave to me, that I incurred by the gift to me, uh, let's settle it out of court, Lord, and uh, just don't abandon me. I need your help, but uh, let it be elsewhere, because, Lord, fulfillment is so attractive these days. Um, shall we settle it out of court in that way, by leaving the institute, leaving the priesthood, leaving the religious sort life, uh, not while we have any... The, not while the grace of God continues to be effective in us, and that, we have been assured, is a lifetime effectiveness, and so let's leave it at that. Now you know, of course, from your experience thus far, that uh, this particular life of virginity has been fruitful. If I were to say to you, how many converts do you have, how many converts do you and you and you have, that wouldn't be the way to put the question. Uh, we might become quite complacent there and uh, attribute to ourselves things that uh, we must attribute to God. Uh, in God's eyes, you, the one who perhaps may never have had a, a convert in the sense of having instructed someone and brought them to baptism, some of you may or may not have that experience. Others have had it, and thank God they have, perhaps in numerous cases. But uh, your fruitfulness as an apostle is not just to be gauged in terms like that, because remember your priesthood is the dispositive priesthood. It means attracting people, leading them on, and bringing them, I would say, to the doorstep of the church, or turning them over to the priest, or in the many and the varied kinds of ways in which this supernatural influence is, is uh, made effective in those who come in contact with you. We can't fully gauge that. Uh, we, uh, we can't simply take statistics here and use a contometer or any other kind of device to see what the score is. Uh, this is bound up in faith and in uh, mystery. Uh, uh, you can be sure of this through faith, that it is fruitful, that it is abundantly fruitful, especially if it's, you're thoroughly sincere about it and you're wholehearted about it. That is sufficient guarantee that it is, has been, and will be fruitful in terms of leading others to God, of communicating supernatural life in hidden ways and perhaps at times in more open ways. But whether hidden or open, the fact that it's fruitful is what counts, and of this you have the assurance, and your faith teaches you that it is so. And we need no more guarantee than that. So you are completed, you are fulfilled then, in ways in which mere flesh and blood cannot be fulfilled. What is more, the natural offspring of natural parents, while they bring them joy in their childhood, especially if these children were willed, were wanted, and if sacrifice was made in the rearing of them, which is holy in itself and pleasing to God, yet how often these, the, the offspring bring sorrow to their parents by, uh, by deviating from the faith and doing things which the parents feel so badly about. Beyond the parents' control, because we'll say they raised them well and did 
right by them, and yet they're caused a heartbreak because of what the children do. We, of course, are spared that because that, those who are the children of our spiritual union, meaning the spiritual life that has been communicated, is in itself spiritual fertility, and it brings us joy, it brings us gladness through this personal union with Christ. Many a person, a married man and woman, has been heartbroken by their children to whom they have been instrumental in bringing the faith, only to see them abandon it, even abandon religious life that they have called and have been called to that and have brought honor to the family and then suddenly disgrace to the family. Many a man and woman, a married man and woman, have had this sorrow in their old age after having had the joy of seeing a boy stand at God's altar and offer mass, having been filled or thrilled even with that kind of joy, they now see him leaving the priesthood and bringing their old age or their gray hairs down into the grave in sorrow because of what they've done after having been called to so exalted a state, and that's happening more and more. Parents don't want to renounce them, tell them not to come near them, they're their own flesh and blood, but oh, what pain, what sorrow, what grief. They just can't get that thorn out of their hearts. It sticks too deeply. It's too painful. It's a case of living out what's left of their lives in grief, in disappointment, after the great joy which they previously had. Now the chastity of the missionary expresses even with special evidence that love for all mankind which is the fruit of chastity, fruit matured in the Holy Spirit, this chaste love for the world, this diffused maternity which permits fullness of love for the brethren individually and collectively. Chastity lived today demands special vigilance. This demands this faithful, persevering witness of love, a luminous chastity, a poverty of affection. If, it, if by that we understand that we reserve the fullness of our love to the one spouse to whom we are wedded, and in and through him we permit ourselves to love other beings, so that this love is made subservient to the higher love. And this, in turn, it makes us totally rich. <coughs> the serenity of the most stable balance, peace, which follows, deepening from time to time, this total gift of self to God, all of this is a prime reward for the missionary, evidence for all of the height and the truth of uh, such a supernatural vocation. The best that we can do is that from time to time we dwell upon this gift again and again, especially in the light of the scriptures, because it uh, takes upon itself a great luster and beauty when we see in this light, because it's all bound up with the life of Christ, which was foretold in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New, and continues to bear its fruit until the end of time. Certainly, the uh, daily reception of the Holy Eucharist and the moments after communion are an excellent time of renewing your profession, renewing the, your dedication of life through your vow and promises. Renewed intellectually, that is knowingly, willingly, and more and more perfectly and sincerely day by day so that uh, what seemed attractive at first, and now perhaps through the years has become somewhat more difficult in the sense of the wear and tear of this kind of life at times seeming lonely, that it nevertheless has become more ripe and more mature, more mature, more attractive to God, even if perhaps less enthusiastic in the sense of emotional enthusiasm, perhaps devoid of uh, that kind of uh, reaction which maybe it did have in the beginning, but that isn't the test of its fruitfulness, the fact that you are emotional about it. it might be devoid of emotion, it might seem to be a day-by-day -day uphill struggle, but a struggle nevertheless 
which is still fruitful, even more fruitful than before, and slowly but surely and gradually reaching uh, or effecting, accomplishing uh, the purpose for which it was given. Always letting, giving witness to the world that this comes from God, that this is going back to God, and that you are, in that sense, rightly understood, I trust, already living the life of the world to come, in a sense already sitting at the right hand with Christ, because you are now living what you will live for all eternity, and what all the saved will live for all eternity, namely a, in a state or condition of virginal union with Christ. And all the other evils that, um, that history records entirely to our shame. Man lost perspective. He lost his way. These material things became like an end in themselves, and so he was living only for them. And yet they couldn't give him the happiness that he really sought because having a spiritual soul, it can never be satisfied by material things and became disquieted. To worship himself, to be a god to himself, couldn't satisfy because by nature he's dependent and, and that this nature of ours wants something higher to be joined to. But he turned his back upon God and of course found no reason to direct himself to it all. And so the long history of mankind shows that man without God is a kind of caricature of humanity. That uh, he is simply a human being reversed. He's not even as, as acceptable as an animal, but he should act according to his nature. This man acts contrary to his nature. It's a living contradiction. Pitiful creature. Better always if he hadn't ever arrived in the sea. His body begins to rebel against the soul, the concupiscence. The faculties of the soul are disturbed, his mind becomes darkened, his will weakened. He's truly lost his way because he lost his God. But in his goodness, God did uh, immediately offer help. And there's where true love manifests itself. God could have said, you had everything you wanted. The decision was yours. You chose to do what you did and proposed to me. And so you suffered the consequences. I can only say what I would preach. But he didn't do that, and here is a great proof of his infinite love. To feel sorry for the creature of his love. To help him to see his mistake. To offer to him a way or a means of recovery and conversion. So the very, very simple means that was offered to the original parents and to God's people ever since. The very simple means, I say, was faith and obedience. This is the core, this is the foundation of a new people, a people of God. <coughs> faith in what God has said, trust and an obedience to the love of Him. The covenant made with the first parents after their fall required precisely that. They would be given their savior in time, and the offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head. But they must believe, and they must obey. We can't trace the circumstances, the elements, I might say, of the various covenants that God entered into with his people in times past with then, <coughs> I should say first with Noah, when the human race was all but destroyed and then rehabilitated to one man and his very meager offspring required faith on those part and obedience to be the second father of the human race and the savior of mankind. The same with this offspring, with the, this Sam, who was the forbearer of the Semites, the Hebrews. The same with Abraham, leave your father's house, go to the place that I'll show you. What place? Where? You have to believe. I will show you. And you have to wait. And the Lord showed him, he did believe. And he did obey, he became the father of all the universe. 
Even when the great mountains made to him that he would have all to his numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars of the heavens, and he actually had only one son by his wife Sarah, and he was told to sacrifice him. That was a test of faith and obedience. He survived with the test and was confirmed in his office of the father of all believers, in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so we can find the same pattern to reveal itself more and more clearly, and uh, the covenant made with uh, repeated out to the descendants of Abraham, finally to Moses and the people on Mount Sinai, who were to believe in the one God, to do his will, and he would be their savior, their deliverer, no matter how mighty or more powerful their enemy. The various prophets came upon the scene and described the leading coming and announced the coming of the Savior in the never more glowing terms. Yet uh, the messages which are contained in the scriptures given to us for our consolation, messages were so frequently, almost consistently misunderstood and distorted. A virgin would conceive and bear a son. She would call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. What a wonderful guarantee of eventual salvation through such a one whose very name would get to announce his mission, that of bringing God in our midst. This would be a new creation, quite different from the creation of the first man. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will be on his shoulders, he will be the Prince of Peace. The prophecy from the same, I said. The God will us proud from the root of Jesse. He didn't know even what particular family he wanted to come from, the family of David. To be a shepherd, we are told by Prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel too. We are told by Micaiah that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But the town, so small and insignificant, he did many other things as a result of the captain who would come forth and lead his people, Israel, namely Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Again, the prophet Isaiah foretells his passion, death, and resurrection. So that all these things took place in advance. And finally, or I should say, the next of the scenes that is presented to us in this wonderful and mysterious history of salvation is a little cave of a manger, and a child was born of a virgin. What connection does this have with the garden of the pleasure? Well, when the first man arrived on the scene, he was so distracted by the material things as to misunderstand that he was called into sin the purpose of material creation, the true relationship of material things to the spiritual. Preferring the material to the spiritual, wanting to be the sole and undisputed master of his destiny, he makes himself a God and then goes to it, that is, enjoys it, only to find out that the very things that he came to enjoy eventually destroyed him and led him to his death because he put God out of the picture. He acted as though there were no God instead of recognizing God's likeness within him. So God shaken his eyes on a different approach. This time it would be another creation, another birth, another man born into the world. Not in a garden, but in a cave. In the merest, simplest, <coughs> most necessary, and uh, the most restricted kind of material environment and situation to which a man could possibly be born. Even in a place intended for the shelter of animals rather than of men. In this cave, the virgin, foretold by the prophet, who took herself with her spouse, husband Joseph. And there the mystery of salvation unfolds when the Son of the Living God was not born of the earth, earthly, but born of the Father before all ages, and now takes upon himself our human nature and is born into the world and into these lowly circumstances. What does he want to teach us about that? He wants to tell us about the true relationship he is between the material and the spiritual world, the supremacy, the transcendence of the spiritual over the material. In fact, that so little of the material world is really needed for the life of the spirit. That 
said, we can, and indeed we do, seem to live closer to God. If the cry of God blow to his and his things, so that our attention is given less to those things that are so passing, and more, our attention is given more to the things of the Spirit, because our future life, our life in eternity, will need to be known of none of these things. Just a little bit of flesh so as to make him into a, a baby boy, a human being. A little bit of shelter so that he wouldn't really be the trees or be exposed to the elements and perish. A little food from his own mother's body. And we have God with us. We have a new Adam born. And this was a birth from above. And the story of this around the life of this child has been the very opposite. The antithesis of that which we have been contemplating concerning the first parents made from the earth. That's the St. Paul likes to express it. The requisite of faith and obedience, which is the way back to God, is fully expressed in the life of this child. Faith, of course, has given way to vision in his regard because he comes forth from God. He sees and beholds God, and the angel of the denying the Father, he will give the perfect witness to the Father. And as far as material things are concerned, although he is the Lord of the universe, and all things were made in him, through him, for him, yet to help us to understand more clearly and to be able to control him, he chooses the least amount of material things. Just enough to show us that he too has a body made of matter, which is good, blessed by faith and blessed by God. But the Adam can get along with so little. He can be detached from it. He will not use it. Whatever is really necessary for the life of man in his sojourn on this earth and in his preparation for the life to come. The image of the pilgrim is a biblical image of the evil, which is clearly stressed in the council documents. And what is the special emphasis on this word, this image, is not to tell us that when you go on a pilgrimage, you don't take your whole house with you and all your utensils. You take the least amount of provision. You don't have to get you there and back, or even you have to pick up things on the way, so you will not have to carry them all. And uh, so you can tie your belt and gird your loins and get your staff and a little pack on your back and off you go on your pilgrimage. <coughs> That's the image that is presented to us. Certainly there's no attachment to material things there, but you can carry them anyway. You can take them with you. And that's what we are, what the Lord wants to tell us as we stand there and contemplate him at the crib of the manger in Bethlehem. How much of mystery there is, how much to contemplate. What important lessons for the success of life we learn right here. As we see this, contrast it with the God of Eden, and then try to look forward to where this kind of a life that we see before our eyes, the Virgin, the Father Joseph and the child, that kind of a life will not be for us. A pilgrim life, yes. The only kind of life that will lead us back to the Father and cause God to live in us and with us again. 
is a means to die, which is even far more uncomfortable. You need to go to the pain, the cross, has a big enough one to stretch himself out on. It shows you that this is all you needed. What is the perfect proof of this love of God and love of mankind? Because he wanted to expire on it. He wanted to bring back to that tree that the garden had eaten that withered away as a result of the curse upon it, the mysteries of it. He wanted to water that again, bring it back to life. Show us the true knowledge of good and evil. To give us the power to choose the good and avoid the evil. When uh, the cross was be due to his blood and it came for us. Hmm? You're going to have the blip, blip, blip again? Hmm? You're going to have the blip, blip, blip? Yeah. I'll just use this back to go see that. I think, I think he thinks it's important. All yelling and my sister. <laughs> Can I give just you some so. Barbara's had too many? <laughs> no, thanks. Mm. No, I don't really think the batteries are very good, though. Don't you think? Really? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah say something in. quick, Irene. Nobody else. I gotta wait for us to say now. something before you turn it on. Huh? You'll, you'll miss it by that time. Oh no, I think you'll say it over again. <laughs> oh heavens! If you want to say it over again, that'll. <laughs> say it over again. This is kale. Anybody want a kale? Yes. Thank you. Tell mm -hmm. your boyfriend, Mr. Belfiore, called up today. Mm -hmm. He liked the history of the Willa Cortona. Oh dear. He's a short history on tape, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Joyce, you almost put your meat in the microphone, didn't you? <laughs> Do we go to the CCD class tonight? Hmm? Yeah, we do. What made you think we didn't? I thought it was a year off. You can hire a car. Two more weeks. Another week for you off. Hmm? Another week for you off. We're not even off next week. No. Uh -huh. No. Oh, no problem. Hmm? That's said One more week and then we're going to these days. Katie, you can't be so cold that you forget you can't say anything. Talking. I mean, you were just not, I mean, uh, you don't want me to red up or run up a red flag, do you, when I'm, when I'm talking or something? Well, no, but you haven't started any controversial subject. That thing under the table. <laughs> the controversial subject is that she's cold. Mm, well, she I wanted some wine. I was told I couldn't have it, so. <laughs> she said she well, wanted to the syrup. Maybe some other... Uh, in the, uh, in the family in there, didn't you have one to look for? That wouldn't be so good. I better stay here. Yeah, you better stay here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, turn on. Do we have anything to talk about you, Stan Kitty? Well, I don't know. I have. It depends on who's up. supposed to listen. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's it for? Mm -hmm. I up who's the it for? Now I'm just practicing. Oh. She's going to erase it. She's going to erase it. That's my work? thing that she didn't say that. Y'all probably won't say anything if you think I'm going to erase it. Catherine, mm -hmm. <laughs> tell us uh, how did you spend your day? Mm -hmm. I really went for a time. No, well, I got one thing to tell you. What? You had a party. Well, you, no, tell well, us we about did that. Champagne party. Well, it, wasn't, it was Foreman's champagne because it was ginger ale. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, why, you know.